here on the F Ratings Eventing Podcast, we have teamed up with our great friends at FedMax, along with our very own Spike the Vet, to give you guys, our lovely listeners, some tip-top tips on how to keep your horses happy and healthy in the stable environment. So, Spike, what have you got for us to get us started? Well, here we are. Tip-top tips. And it's so important to reduce our risk of respiratory disease using a bedding with the lowest possible dust rating, such as Bedmax, is the absolute cornerstone to ensure um, a happy and healthy respiratory environment for a horse. Along with that, a really well ventilated stable environment so that we can maximize that clean air for the horse in the area where it's breathing as well. So in the corners, and it is criminal how many stables I go to. And these would be in very professional yards where we still see cobwebs dust all kinds of things in those corners around water drinkers around feeding bowls feeding troughs hay bars all these sort of things and it's so important that we make sure that that's a better environment for them so not only a good quality bedding but also you've got to whip out your feather duster or your henry hoover and make sure you get in all the nooks and crannies Oh, you've got to get your feather duster out. Otherwise, I'll get my white gloves and I'll be checking out for how much dust there is. But <laughs> seriously, it's very important. And it is unbelievable how often it's overlooked. There you go, listeners. A tip, top tip for you from our very own Spike the Vet, courtesy of our lovely friends at Bedmax. Thank you, Nicole. And look forward to coming back with some more tip, top tips. We have got, listeners, another When Nicole Met show for you and two in swift succession because next on the show is an Italian rider who has represented Italy at three European championships, a world championships as well, a couple of world championships as well, in fact. Um, He has been on the podcast before, Giovanni Ugolossi. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me back. Uh, not a Hall of Fame show yet, but maybe one day. It, it will be there. Don't worry. Uh, give me a few years and I would love to be a Hall of Fame show. <laughs> You're working on it. I would say as well, we were we were looking at getting you on the show and there was it was going to be a pint of gin with Gio. It could have been anything. Uh, but <laughs> when Nicole met it is, um, and a big, big thank you. As always, listeners, has to go to Bed Max uh, for their support of the show. But... Um, first of all, Joe, take us back to growing up in Italy. How did you fall in love with horses? Well, actually, it took me a while because my mom, I can't remember this, but my mom took me to my local pony club. And she said uh, the first couple of times she put me on a pony, I was uh, terrified and I wouldn't stop crying uh, and uh, I didn't really want to do it. And then, uh, you know, she carried on taking me and then suddenly I got the bag of it uh, and she bought me my first pony. And then I did, uh, you know, the little pony things that is slightly different in Italy. But uh, we have the under 13 pony championship, the over 13 pony championship. My pony, actually, I tell you this funny story. The first, uh, I think I was 12 or 13 and I went to the Italian championship for under 13. And my pony was very spooky at water. And he was very good in the dressage. I think I was second or third or whatever after the dressage. And took me probably about 15 minutes to get him in the water. And that uh, I thought uh, it was the end of my career. That's it. I didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, I think five or six ponies just can't pass me through the water. I did try to follow them, but it was no chance. And uh, after that, uh, actually, I did stick to it. And I did, uh, I think, one uh, junior European uh, championship in Pratoni, actually. And uh, didn't really go to plan either because my horse got uh, hurt in the steeplechase because we had the steeplechase at the time. And then, um, yeah, I just... Uh, decided that uh, probably riding horses uh, is uh, is what I wanted to do and I went in the army because you know my parents did support me as much as they could uh, but of course they didn't have the funding to buy me a million of horses uh, to carry on supporting me and the army was the only way for me to try to actually achieve what I wanted to achieve and uh, yeah that's how we all, all started. That's amazing. So were your family horsey? 
my mom was a little bit, you know, she still have a horse at home that she hack out uh, occasionally. My dad is no horsey whatsoever. Actually, he came to the World Championship in Rome uh, last September, probably since uh, my junior championship to watch an event. <laughs> like he's not, he, he enjoys what I'm doing, uh, but he, he's not really familiar with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about the, the Italian army and how that kind of kick-started your eventing career because it's a dynamic that I'm really interested about um you know it's something that we see a lot in in Italian event riders and kind of the Royal Air Force and the army so how does it work I basically started because uh for guys of my age being in the army was compulsory you have to do one year in the army and we had actually the choice to decide where we want to spend that year and because I love horses uh, and I love riding, I decided to go in the army, uh, in the riding part of the army. And, uh, you know, they supply you horses, uh, horses that uh, I would say from four, five, six, seven, uh, and then a little bit more up the level. They wouldn't be amazing horses, but actually they start to get you out and about uh, and see what actually their routine of competing is. And um, I was there for five, six years, I think, until from 18 until I was 24 or 25. And then because I want to actually upgrade slightly the way I was riding and the competition that I was planning to do, I've decided to leave because the horses that I had at the time were not good enough to take me where I wanted to be. And, uh, yeah, I left uh, and worked for a season uh, near, near home. And then, uh, yeah, that's how it all uh, started in the army. And then after I came to England, they did ask me to join again because for them it's very good uh, to promote the uniform uh, at big event. And, uh, you know, I'm in the army, for example, other people are in the Air Force or in the police or in the Carabinieri. They, they just love uh, to have people riding at the uniform and in other sports as well, you know, they have runners they have uh, swimmers uh, but they like people to be at the top of their game to promote the uniform so do you have to be in a uniform to represent italy at a major championship you don't no no you don't have to be but uh, most of the top riders let's talk about eventing are because they get approached from the army to actually ride in their uniform okay and there's benefits to that obviously um exactly Going back a few years before that kind of jump over to England and setting up your yard yeah. and your business over here, actually, am I right in thinking that the the kind of the year that you spent working in Rome would be when you met who who was to become your wife, Catherine Robinson? No, actually, no. I met her when I left the army uh, that I was working uh, in the yard near uh, near home. She came with her horses. Uh, to be based, uh, let's call it Sunshine Tour in Italy, because we have uh, a few competitions that start a little bit sooner than England. And she was planning to actually, I think, get one or going to go to a championship. I can't remember which championship it was. She had an advanced horse at the time uh, that she she just need to do a few events at the start of the season. And she came with three or four horses where I was based, and the rest is history. The rest is history, as they say. <laughs> um, I love a love story, listeners. We covered it actually in much more detail on last year's Valentine's special, which you can go back and listen to. Uh, it's well worth it. It's a cracking meat cute. I think you'd call it a meat cute in the movies, <laughs> as they would say. Um, so moving to England then, what was yeah. your set up when you first came over to England? I guess, first of all, why did you come to England? What was the main driving force for you? Well, the England, I think, uh, you know, is the place to be if you want to try to be an event rider. I think there's no other place is that you have the possibility and the chance to bring on horses like you have over here. And it was always at the back of my mind uh, that uh, one day, no, I wasn't I wasn't planning to move here full time, but I want maybe to spend a season or two seasons over here to see what it was all about. And uh, because I wasn't overly happy what I was doing uh, at home, I got the chance to actually 
come over here for Catherine and for actually try to achieve, uh, you know, what I wanted to achieve in my career. And uh, that's why I moved over to England. And what was it like when you first came over in terms of establishing yourself as a business and kind oh, of pursuing was, the right? It was very, very, very hard because uh, well, I didn't really know anyone. I didn't really have any money. I came over with two horses uh, and Catherine, I think, had a couple at the time. We had them in a livery yard, just a uh, boomerang stable just outside uh, Angerford. And uh, Catherine was riding out to make some money for Alan King at the time. I was doing the horses in the morning when she was riding out. And then uh, I was uh, to try to make some extra money in the evening going to work in, in an Italian est- restaurant to be a waiter. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what, uh, yeah, it wasn't really a setup at the beginning. It was try, try to actually make it happen. What was the hardest thing about that? Uh, it wasn't really hard because I really enjoyed and in my mind I had uh, something that I wanted to achieve and you know working hard is uh, if you want to achieve something I don't think is hard is uh, I, I really enjoyed every minute of it you know like yeah of course you get up at five o'clock in the morning and probably you go to bed uh, at 11 o'clock at night but uh, is, is hard to actually is hard there now because you need to look after a little person that is depending on you you know when you are 20 or 25 I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call it hard I love that actually working hard isn't hard if you want to achieve something I think that's really that's a really really interesting take on it and actually something that we can it's kind of that positive mental attitude that mindset that makes such a difference uh, so when did you ride out for and and work a little bit with Andrew Nicholson then that was the second year that I was over because I had actually a very good horse when I came over called Matisse de Val Marina that uh, it was owned by an Italian lady, that the plan was to produce him uh, and then sell him on. And I think I came over. And the first year, I was first and second with two horses. Uh, one was Matisse and one was uh, a horse of Catherine. That actually, she had a fall and she couldn't ride it, and I rode it. And uh, I was first and second in Hartbury, I think, what is now the two-star long. And uh, I thought in my head, oh, that, that, that is easy. Like, what is everyone going on about that uh, competing in England is that hard? And then I went to Po, and the same horse won uh, what is now the three star. And then uh, I did start to ride out for Andrew the year after that. Uh, like, I, again, I was doing my horses in the morning. And then I, I really wanted to learn. And for me, Andrew is, uh, you know, the eventing god. I would, and I had the possibility to go, I think it was three or four mornings a week. To ju- I was going for free because I just wanted to learn. Uh, I just want to watch, uh, watch him ride, understand uh, how the yard was run. Uh, and uh, actually, it's been amazing with me because after that, he gave me the ride of an advanced source that uh, at the time it wasn't good enough for him, but actually it was my first horse uh, that took me to, to five star called Storm Hill Cossack. And, and what about Storm Hill Cossack? Because actually that sort of that first five star journey is always yes. kind of, the, I guess, a, a memory that that riders competing at the very top level always remember your first five star. What was it like Definitely. for you and, and how did he teach you? Because it's not always the easiest taking on a horse at the upper levels, especially no, from the likes of somebody like Andrew Nicholson. They're big old no. shoes to fill. It definitely wasn't, but at the time, I think you're a little bit naive. And again, because you really want to do it, you don't think too much uh, what is going to go wrong. You are thinking a lot more, actually, to try to do the right thing. And uh, I took on the horse, uh, it being a bit naive, I think uh, he did, I can't remember now, but I know I think he was fifth in Sumor the, the first year I rode him. And then I think he was selected to go to the World Championship in Kentucky. But the owner wasn't very confident in putting him on a plane and do the five, the first five star of the horse, uh, you know, after such a long journey, because actually he had some breeding problem as well. And we decided to actually go to Po to do his first five star. 
and actually it was good because I think it was, I don't know, 10 for 12 or something like that. That at the back of my mind, I said, oh, I really want to do my first World Championship, but probably it was the right thing to do because, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was young, I was in that experience, uh, and I didn't know the horse that well. And uh, yeah, the, doing the five star again, like in, now thinking backward, actually what I did, uh, how naive I was, uh, it went, uh, it went pretty well. And was it, you say that kind of you really wanted to do a world championship. Was was the championship dream something that you'd always kind of had well, in I the back say, of your mind? Well, was, yes, I would say as an event rider, what you want to do is uh, riding around five stars and properly represent your nation in the best of your ability. And world championship, European championship as an Olympics uh, is, uh, yeah, every year uh, from then uh, been my aim. And the horse that made it happen, Stilo Contica. Tell us a little bit about him. And before that, I think the first championship was Malmo 2013 at the Europeans. Is that right? Yes, it was. Yeah, that that was my first uh, my first championship. Well, Stilo Contica actually was bought uh, from Jason Ob, knowing uh, that he was a very strong horse. You know, I'm I'm quite tall. I think I can hold a strong horse, and I took him cross country school in the first time. And again, being a bit young and naive and cocky, I rode him around. I said, what are they going on about? This horse is not strong. And then I took him out doing his first open intermediate. And he's like, he's probably one of the best horses or best jumper I ever sat on. And he took off uh, out of the start box like a completely different horse. He was a demon. I had a snapple at the time because I don't think the horse was strong at all. And they actually told me that he was quite strong. And then I did let him run. Uh, in Aston Le Wolves, they had this little upright palisade. I did let him run and we both flipped. And since then, I put something else in his mouth. <laughs> so how did you find the secret? Once, you, once you'd once you kind of got the brakes under control? Um... Uh, it's a horse that, because he had such a good jump, uh, was nothing really to back him off. And that's why he was getting, I think, a little bit strong. Uh, it, the secret was actually, I did find the secret actually by the end of his career. It was having not to fit, don't jump him too much. Uh, and actually, again, talking with Andrew, don't even warm him up uh, before cross country. Literally, I went to badminton the first tier and I probably jumped one fence and off I went. That's brave. <laughs> They're brave or stupid, call it how <laughs> you like. <laughs> what was that first championship like? The the kind of the moment that you've dreamed of um when it came true? How was it that? was it was amazing. I think um uh, it was a very it was a young team. I think it was me, Victoria. Oh, I can't remember who was in it. Uh, but you know, driving because I drove the old box there. And driving to Malmo is a very long way. But, you know, the bus that you get to actually do your first championship, it seems actually driving two hours down the road. It didn't feel a long journey at all. And um, the place actually is amazing. Like, it, it wouldn't be the best place to have an event because it's very, very narrow and you go up and down quite a few times, and especially for Tico. It definitely wasn't the best course uh, in the world. But, uh, yeah, I remember like it was now. It was great. Uh, I had a very good time. I think he jumped double clear. The dresser was never his forte uh, because he had, like, he was built a bit downhill uh, and I wasn't very good uh, either. But it was great. You know, jumping double clear around your first championship, I think, is is a very, very good thing. It's a very special moment. Actually, it was a young team. There was yourself, Vittoria, uh, Luisa Pali and Stefano Fioravanti. Game, that's the way yeah. you know a lot Brenton. more than I do but... I, I would love to, I'd love to say Joe that I knew that all off the top of my head I didn't <laughs> I totally uh did just double check it but there you go um so what about the the kind of setup that you have now talk us through the setup that you and Catherine have at Cranford Stud and, and I guess the um the model at which you both work so you're both very very busy young family competing at the top level Yes, it changed a lot. Our setup changed a lot from uh, when Finn actually was born. Because before, I think, uh, you know, everything is about horses, everything is about eventing, and you don't really have anything else to think about. As soon as someone else uh, 
enter your life, uh, you know, is completely a different mindset. And uh, you actually need to supply for uh, for this person and you need to change completely. I, we actually had to change completely the way we were doing things. Now, actually, we are in a very lucky, well, we have our yard uh, just outside Cheltenham in a beautiful place that is owned by Brian, Vicky and Julie Chu. We are renting the yard there and we were able actually to buy a little cottage uh, in a village nearby. And uh, we have about 20 horses uh, that I would say we own uh, probably three of them that Catherine rides because what she mainly does, and she's amazing, apart from helping me out uh, a lot in riding uh, the horses that are in the yard, but actually she produces them beautifully and uh, we sell them on to actually make, uh, try to make a little bit of money. Before, uh, what uh, probably I was doing wrong is trying to have uh, one too many horses in the yard that actually I didn't really need because I thought in my head, more horses in the yard you have, uh, more money you are making. But it's not actually like that. I think you need to find a good balance uh, because, of course, more horses you have, more stuff you need to employ. More of your hours of the day are going and there's no always having uh, 30 horses in the yard that will make you money. I think you need to find a balance, an happy medium to be able to do everything in the right way and then also make your money. Yeah, I think that's very, very sensible, actually. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because you've got to work smarter, not hard. Uh, smarter? What does it work smarter, not harder? Is that the, is that I think, mean? yeah, you, you, you yeah. still work hard enough, uh, but in a smarter way, put it yes. that way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so what about the future? Obviously, one big thing that isn't on your CV as yet is an Olympic Games. Is that something very much on your radar? Obviously, Paris is fast approaching now. Oh, honestly, it's really bugging me to be honest with you because <laughs> I've been I've been in this game for quite a long time now, and for whatever reason, you know, the horses went wrong, or whatever reason, I never never done an Olympic game, and uh, next year I really need need to try to be in it uh, you know of course uh, and you need a little bit of luck as well but luckily i think i do have the best bunch of horses i ever had uh, and i really hope one of them will be there uh catherine will tell you all about the olympic experience in the meantime. <laughs> i was there i was there watching it don't worry <laughs> i know i did experience the watching part of it i would like to experience the riding part of it <laughs> what about what about home world championships last year oh that Britain. was amazing that was amazing boy it wasn't amazing my performance to be honest i was expecting to do a little bit better uh but for whatever reason i didn't like uh you know that is eventing for you but uh saying uh, saying that uh, you know be back in italy in pratoni with a world championship and it, it had a different for me a different feel about the other world championship uh, that I did. Boy, well, I only did one, but let's say the other championship uh, that I did, because uh, be at home, I'm presenting your own nations at home, uh, like I still have the goosebump on now, is, is something that uh, probably I will never experience again in my riding career, but is, uh, is yeah, it's amazing. Like the buzz and the feel that you feel in the air, it was uh, a feeling that I never experienced before. And it was kind of a case of, of so near yet so far, because yes, the home championships, and there's always that sort of good deal of pressure around having a home a home championships as well with a home crowd and kind of added yeah. media pressures and everything else. The, the golden Olympic qualification tickets were on offer and Italy haven't yet got their Olympic qualification. So what? how does that impact the sport and actually plans then for 2023? Uh, the plan actually did slightly change because uh, with uh, you know with an Olympic qualification already in the bag, probably with the horse that I rode at the World Championship, a five star or badminton or whatever was uh, on site. But now a bit with the owners, uh, with myself uh, and the federation, we have decided to concentrate uh, all the preparation to do Nations Cup. Uh, concentrate on the European Championship uh, and then 
again, I've decided uh, for what happened before in the past uh, few years, uh, not to do a five stars uh, until Paris, because, you know, you put a lot more pressure on the horses if you need to prep them for a five star, not only the competition, but, you know, all the preparation that gets into it. And uh, I've decided that our main focus will be Paris. Uh, if we get there, great. If we don't, then we we rethink it. But it will be no five star uh, for us uh, until Paris. And one of the ways that the Olympic ticket will be on offer this year is through the Nations Cup series. So is that going to be a big focus for the Italian team this year? Yes, I would say boy, starting, I think, next week or this week in Montelibretti with the first one. And we will try to have a team uh, in every single uh, Nations Cup competition that uh, that is uh, that is on. Like, of course, over here we have riders that will do Chatsworth uh, and Mill Street. Uh, then the riders in Italy will probably do Montelibretti, of course, because it's at home. Then I think the next one will be in Stratcombe. Then I probably will go myself with one of my good horses to Jardy. Then I will probably go to Arville as well. Uh, but after the European Championship, then we will know a lot more uh, if we need to carry on just to push for the Nations Cup or if we can take, uh, you know, if we can put the brakes on and concentrate on other competitions. Yeah, and, and kind of ch- look at the focus as to, to where it needs to be before, at the end of the year going into next season. Um, exactly. What about the other horses in your yard? Tell us a bit about your your top guys. I mean, Duke of Champions is the horse that you rode at the Worlds last year and very much the one aimed for the Europeans this year. Um, yeah. Swirly Temptress is one that has always caught my eye because she's not a princess. <laughs> She's, she's fantastic. But the story of Swirly is that she came into the yard when she was free. The owner sent her, she's dressage bred. She was bred for the daughter of the owner to do a bit of dressage with. She, she wasn't really good enough to actually be a top dressage horse. And the owner asked me, oh, what do you think? She can, could she make an event? I said, well, yeah, I think she can. And uh, she was meant to stay for uh, two or three months to be broken in and uh, 10 years later she's still with us <laughs> and uh, she's uh, she's a mare that I really really rate like she's she's beautiful uh, she's really really willing uh, and uh, she she actually coming into her own now that she's she's 11 now you know every year she step up a level she struggle a little bit with her show jumping but now she's getting stronger and, uh, you know, with uh, a lot of help uh, from my trainer, Grant Wilson, uh, I think we actually clicked there and uh, I think she will be a very, very good horse. You know, she won already a four-star long last year. She wasn't that far off until I popped up uh, over the last in Bocelo. I think she has, uh, she has another couple of big wins in her. She's a really, really smart mare. And actually, I remember um, seeing her... God, Blenheim 2021, I think the show jumping in the eight and nine-year-old class, and it was really, really foggy. Um, yeah. And she didn't have the happiest of rounds. And then I was stood watching at Thorsby, um, went, went for a busman's holiday, listeners. I was actually just purely <laughs> spectating, stood at the side of the show jumping arena and noticed her jumping absolutely out of her skin. And she just looked like she'd come on so much in confidence um, and yeah, it's, just, it's a lot about confidence with her because uh, it's a horse that actually she has a pencil too. Then uh, she actually lose a little bit of, uh, as, yeah, as you said, confidence and she gets a little bit, uh, oh, oh God, I, I, I'm trying, but actually I can't try any harder. You need to keep her confident and you need to give her the chance to actually use herself in the best possible way. And then she will give you absolutely everything. Well, it certainly looks very, very exciting for this year. What will be the plan with her? I take it possibly some of those Nations Cup. Will she do another long format as well? She won't do a long one uh, because she will be my backup horse uh, for the Europeans. She will probably do Chatsworth. She will do Mill Street uh, Nations Cup. uh, See how we are after that. And uh, maybe because I'm taking my other horse to Jardy, she will do Bergen Four Star. And then if she's not going to the Europeans, then she needs to do a long for next year. That probably we try to to go to Bocalo again, something like that. 
Okay, good plan. And what about some of the younger horses coming through? Because there there look to be a couple of really nice seven-year-olds in particular, or seven-year-olds at the back end of last season that went very well at Lyon. Yes, I got two seven-year-olds that I really rate. One is called Eddie Deluxe, that is a little chestnut stallion that was at Lyon as a six-year-old. He jumped double clear, but he jumped double clear last year as a seven-year-old. Is uh, again a horse that was bred by Jules Stiller, by um, Duke of Heart uh, out of a castle And uh, you know, I have quite a lot of Duke of Heart horses that I I, I do really like them. He's uh, a thoroughbred sire that gives them lots of gallop, lots of stamina. And uh, yeah, Ralph is called in the stable. I think he's definitely a horse that will step up to advance. Uh, this year, probably aiming for Blenheim, eight, nine years old. I wouldn't do a long this year with him because uh, I think doing a long with an eight years old is quite a lot. But uh, if everything goes to plan, it will be probably my fifth uh, horse qualified for next year, doing a long one the spring of next year. Okay. And cool. the, the other one is called Kimball, that actually was uh, is an amazing horse. He came to me to be sold. Uh, September, uh, no, last year, the year before, never evented, only do, did a little bit of show jumping with the owner. And uh, this year we decided, uh, because he's quite willing, he's a very good cross country horse, uh, let's try to take him to Lyon. And he did his first pre novice in March uh, and suddenly he rocks up to do the, the seven years old world championship in Lyon Danger. And uh, it was good. This year he will take it a little bit easier because he was pushed quite hard. Uh, Last year, we'll probably stay at intermediate and freestyle to just get uh, everything right and then we'll step up to advance next year. And am I right in thinking that both of those two are stallions? No, only one. Only, only the one. chestnut. Only yeah, the chestnut. No, the, okay. the deluxe is a stallion. Kimball is uh, a gelding. Kimball is a gelding. I'll blame the FEI database for that. Okay. Little, is this still that a stallion on that? Still, still shown as the stallion, but that's okay. That's okay. Keeps me on my toes, listeners. Wouldn't want to get too comfortable. <laughs> um, are there any other horses in your yard that our listeners should absolutely be looking out for this year? Uh, they are. I'm very, I'm very, in a very lucky position at the moment to have very, very nice horses and very, very nice owner. I never had the chance or the possibility to actually have owner to buy horses for myself. You know, I always been given horses. And uh, actually, the last couple of years, I went out uh, with my owners and buy what I wanted to buy. And from uh, four, five, uh, and six years old now that I bought myself, I, I really like them all. It will be actually no right to say one, because all the one I have, I think they are very, very nice horses. And uh, I also have another horse that it was injured uh, quite a few times he's back now and touch wood uh, he will be he was fifth in Blenheim a few years ago called Duke of Champion actually without the S at the end is a little bit confusing do you know what I was gonna I was gonna ask you about that so there's Duke of Champion who um is one horse that was the horse that went to Blenheim a couple of years ago and then there's Duke of Champions who went that is the one I the way yeah that's correct is uh, is weird because we have Duke of Champion without the S. Uh, we bought him for Catherine actually as a four years old, and he's now thirteen. And uh, he grew a bit too big for Catherine. I took him on as a six years old, and then he was amazing as a seven years old. I think he was placed in Osberton. He won a free long, and then as an eight years old, he had a bit of a patch here. But then as a nine years old, he was very very good again in Blenheim and then he picked up a few injuries you know he's always been a little bit on and off uh, but now he's back uh, and hopefully he will stay he will stay right because I think he's definitely a horse that he will go my plan is actually to take him five star but no until as I said after Paris because I think he can give it a good shot okay exciting and I won't lie the Duke of Champion Duke of Champions listeners You'll probably be as confused as I am and you'll have to look up both their records. Um, <laughs> but it keeps us all on our toes. Um, Gio, thank you so much. For, oh, it's for a pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been great. It, it has been lovely to have you on the show. And um, we're very, very much looking forward to following your progress and Italy's progress going forward through 2023. Fingers crossed.
Thank you very much, Nicole. Our pleasure. Uh, Listeners, I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode of When Nicole Met. And we'll be back very soon with more. But if you have enjoyed the show, then you know what to do. Please do share it across social media. Uh, Tag us as you're listening. We would love to see where you're listening from. Um, And of course, leave a review on your chosen podcast platform as well, because it does make all the difference. For now, though, that is all we've got time for. And we'll be back very soon with lots more on the Eco Ratings Eventing Podcast.